uh, questions about the last lecture? Yeah. Why did the nucleon uh, enzyme scatter is the term for the uh, repulsive for odd partial wave effect for partial wave? Hmm. Well, because if it were a direct potential, it would be attractive for all partial waves, right? It's a attractive Yukawa potential. We showed that in the static model. And the sign obviously go through. The sign does not change if we make the mass of the particles infinitely heavy. <laughs> the, uh, therefore, it is a. Uh, it is would if it were a direct exchange with those signs, it would be a um, attractive potential, and therefore attractive in all partial waves. The effect of the exchange operator. Exchange is to uh, multiply uh, the exchange operator has as its eigenstates angular momentum eigenstates in the center of mass frame and multiplies even partial waves by plus one and odd partial waves by minus one. Therefore, in the even partial waves, it's just as it would be if it were a direct potential, but in the odd partial waves, it's as if it's minus the corresponding direct potential. That's how it can be attractive in even partial waves and repulsive in odd partial waves. The same thing with an overall sign uh, flip explains why the pi on nucleon system has a nearly bound uh, uh, state uh, resonance, low lying resonance, in L equals 1, but not in L equals 0. That would be a very hard thing to figure out in terms of ordinary potentials. Because ordinary potentials, if they were attractive in L equals 1, would be even more attractive in L equals 0, because they wouldn't have a centrifugal barrier. But an exchange potential changes sign as you go from one partial wave to another. So it can be attractive in L equals 1 and repulsive in L equals 0. Yes, sir? Uh, can you elaborate on why? Uh, from one channel to another? Well, um, I guess um, You know you can't. I mean, the sort of analytic continuation we're making is from a process like 1 plus 2 goes into uh, 3 bar plus 4 bar into 1 plus 2 bar goes into 3 plus 4 bar. Uh, whoops, 1 plus 3 bar goes into 2 plus 4, off to a great start, as usual. right? And you know in non-relativistic physics, you don't even have to have an antiparticle along with a particle. So, it's, so not only can't you analytically continue, the existence of the first amplitude doesn't even necessarily imply that the second amplitude exists. Now, why does this happen? The reason is that the distance in the complex plane between this point and this point, the characteristic scale, is on the order of the particle masses. Right? You have the, con this is S equals 0. Sorry, S equals 0 t equals 0, u equals 0. I may have them switched around. It doesn't matter, these lines. The distance, say, from here to here, from the nearest point, is on the order of the masses of the particles. Right? Who asked that question? I want to look at him to make sure he's understand. <laughs> that means in terms of energy, OK, which is what we write scattering amplitudes as functions of in non-relativistic physics, the distance is on the order of mc squared. Therefore, if we let c go to infinity, which is what the non-relativistic limit means, the distance between here and here becomes infinite. Can't analytically continue over an infinite distance. The things are no longer connected processes. It's relativity that makes them connected. And say that really oh, no, 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 no. As far as an analytic in the real world, you certainly can analytically continue. 
I mean, these are analytic or more properly meromorphic functions. If I know them in any stretch of the complex plane, no matter how small, I know them everywhere. That's the characteristic of analytic functions. In principle, if I knew the pi on nucleon scattering amplitude with 100% accuracy, okay, from threshold to um, one uh, erg, no, erg is a large number in terms of that, one, one billionth of an electron volt, okay, I would know, presuming it had the proper analyticity properties, and it does, the pi on nucleon scattering amplitude everywhere. And I would also know the amplitude for nucleon plus antinucleon goes into two pions, et cetera, everywhere. Okay, no matter how small, if, if it's an analytic function, if you know it perfectly, in any small stretch of the complex plane, you know it perfectly everywhere. Of course, we then real not, in, in the real world, that sort of statement is rather useless because we typically don't know things perfectly. And if you know an analytic function with uh, one millionth of one percent accuracy in a stretch of a complex plane, you may know essentially nothing about it elsewhere. As the example of either the x demonstrates, you know it would be for the entire region to the right of x equals one million, x equals minus one million, you know it with high accuracy, to which it is zero. <laughs> However, if you attempt to find its value by x at x equals plus one million by analytically continuing that excellent approximation, you get garbage. <laughs> <laughs> okay? You really can, in principle, if you knew with perfect accuracy in the non-relativistic domain, with perfect accuracy, but of course, if you knew with perfect accuracy in the non-relativistic domain, that means you are keeping track of the terms v squared over c squared, v fourth over c fourth. Even though they're tiny, you're still keeping them. <laughs> okay? Yes, sir. Well, was I was deriving a formula, which I'll write down. I'll write down our final formulas on the board now, since we'll need them in the lecture. For <coughs> given an initial state that was either one particle state or a two-particle state, normalized such that one particle has probability one of going in, of um, being in the box, and the other particle has probability one of being in any given unit volume. Then I was able to compute the differential transition probability per unit time to a given region of final particles of, of given region of final particle uh, momentum space. And that was given by a formula that was the invariant Feynman amplitude product over the incoming particles, one over twice their energy times of invariant phase space, D which was product over all the outgoing particles, d cubed pi, 2ei, 2 pi cubed, the whole thing times the fourth, an energy momentum conserving delta function. Okay, that's what I was getting. It's a formula that enables me in any scattering process, I either have a particle sitting there and it's starting decaying, it tells me the amplitude for those decay products to come out per unit time, or I have a particle, a beam impinging on a particle I could imagine to be either stationary or moving, and it tells me the amplitude for certain scattering products to come out per unit time. Okay, that was the output. Do you understand that output? So for your confusion, it's presumably about how I obtained it. <laughs>
factors don't you understand? The AFI, I presume you understand. Okay, that's just the thing that as V and T goes to infinity. The 2 pi to the fourth delta force of VT, you understand. That's simply what happens to the integral that gives us the delta function if we're in a box. I presume the factors you don't understand are the 1 over 2 pi cubes, the 1 over square roots of 2 e's, and the 1, uh, one over volume and the 1 over square roots of 2 e's. These come from our expansion of the free field in a box. I can never remember how it goes. Is a and a sum on fee. Well, once again. understand this formula. Do you know where it comes from? It comes from the canonical commutators. You compute it and you get the box completeness relation, which gives you a delta function. Uh, now, <clears throat> therefore, since my states are now not normalized as they were in the previous case, they are not continuum states relativistically normalized, but box, discrete box states normalized to one except for this additional factor of square root of v in the two-particle case, okay? When I go through the computation that leads to the Feynman rule, and I pluck out the annihilation and creation operators that will annihilate my final states and my initial states and spit out my final states, okay? This is the annihilation operator that annihilates the state with momentum p with amplitude 1, right? A sub p on P equals vacuum with coefficient 1. Okay? Therefore, I pick out this thing if I'm writing a given Feynman diagram which a particle of momentum P comes in. And I have coming with it this factor. There's no way of getting away from it. There it is, sitting there. I've got to take it. Okay. Is that a clear answer? Uh, if, if, if you can reformulate your question, you seem still a bit disturbed. If you can reformulate your question so that I can find out what's bothering you, I'll try and answer it more clearly. Um, perhaps I could think about it. If there's still a question, I'll reformulate it. Okay. Yes? Uh, how do you take the eight bars and see if that gives the Feynman rules so you can do the rarity? You don't put them back into the Feynman rules. You put them back into your final answer. When you've got the, when you, it's ridiculous to put a 1 over h bar at every vertex and an h bar in every propagator or something. When you finally, <laughs> when you finally compute a cross section, you know that has dimensions of, uh, of length squared. And when you find, compute a decay rate, you know that has dimensions of 1 over time. And then you put the h bars and c's back in. Uh, for two particle into two particle, they're dimensionless, yeah, as it turns out. You can work that out. In our, I mean, they could still have dimensions. By setting h bar and c equals 1, we have established a dimension, which is a dimension of, of, uh, of length. Okay, so these things can still have dimensions. They'll have dimensions that are certain powers of length or equivalently of inverse mass. For example, okay, <coughs> The action is obviously dimensionless since we're going to exponentiate it, or rather we're going to exponentiate the uh, energy integrated over time. Okay. So therefore, the Lagrange density, which is going to be integrated d4x, has dimensions of L to the minus 4. So its integral d4x will be dimensionless. <coughs> this means, in particular, that d mu phi squared has dimensions l to the minus 4, or since d mu has dimensions l to the minus 1, 
phi has dimensions L to the minus 1. Okay? Likewise, psi has dimensions L to the minus 1. Let's just check that. M squared phi squared is, is also a term in the Lagrange density, so it has dimensions L to the minus 4, M, mu. And therefore, putting this together with this, mu has dimensions L to the minus 1, which I hope you know is right, if h bar and c is 1. Okay, G, psi star psi phi, has dimensions um, Did I make a mistake? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, chalk slippage again. This has dimensions. Uh, here's, this takes care of three of them. So our coupling constant G also has dimensions L to the minus 1 in this theory. A typical term in an invariant matrix element involves something like G squared over p squared minus m squared, where p is some sum of momenta, okay? And that has dimensions l to the minus 2 over l to the minus 2, or l to the 0. <coughs> uh, decay, it would not be so, because then a typical invariant matrix element would have dimensions g. Here's a typical matrix element. It has just a g in it and a bunch of i's and things. <laughs> 1 over L. Okay, it depends on how many particles are in the initial state and how many particles are in the final state. That's because our particle uh, normalization conventions are chock-a-block with delta functions that have dimensions. <laughs> okay, but a 2-to-2 two two matrix element has, is dimensionless, and a 1-to-2 two matrix element has dimensions L to the minus 1. I could also have worked this out just simply by saying the S matrix is dimensionless, but then our states have dimensions because they're normalized by delta functions. Okay. You carry through the same thing and you'll find the same answer. That's why in problem uh, 567, no, 9, I said compute G over MK because that's the dimensionless quantity. Okay. But once you have that, then you can put in the H bars and C's if you want to. Okay. By dimensional analysis, you know how your, your cross section is labeled and to, is ex given to you experimentally in inverse centimeters or inverse fermis. Okay. In the left hand side, you put in everything in whatever unit you, you wish, and you find that the dimensions don't match. You put in sufficient h bars and c's to make the dimensions match. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, as far as we are concerned, if it weren't for if it weren't for the fact that h bar and c are are if it weren't for the fact that we're built on a scale in which h bar, the units in which h bar and c are set equal to 1 are rather strange units for describing macroscopic physics to wit whenever i turn around like this my um, my angular momentum is astronomically large and my linear momentum is astronomically tiny <laughs> if it weren't for that if it weren't for that fact um, uh, we would have all established the convention, the engineers would have established a convention where H bar and C were one, and instead of having the MKS system or the CGS system, we just have the C or the M system. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the problem of, uh, of uh, going to units where H bar and C is not equal to 1 is no more severe than the problem of go reading a weighing machine in England where the damn thing registers your weight in stones. <laughs> <laughs> That's a peculiarity of the English, but I hope we can all add up basses and pounds and then keep the rule for turning stones into pounds into stones in our head. Yes? Uh, I didn't quite understand the proof of the TCP theory. Is it just consistent saying that... If I turn all the momenta into all minus the momentum, Remember, we have four momenta in our process all oriented inward. That means if P0R, the zero component, is greater than zero, 
This is absorption of particle with P equals R. And if P0R is less than zero, this is emission of an antiparticle. with P equals minus PR. That's just the convention. That's what we say when we say we orient all momentum inward. OK? Right? Now, with this convention, it's manifestly obvious that not a single, manifestly obvious is also manifestly redundant. <laughs> it's obvious, or manifest, as you choose, that, that the whole, every Feynman graph to every order in perturbation theory is invariant under the transformation PR goes into minus PR. Change the sign, simultaneously change the sign of all external momentum. You simultaneously change the sign of all internal momenta. Your delta functions are unchanged. Your propagators are unchanged. Your vertices are unchanged. The graph considered as a function of these four. This means that every incoming particle is turned into an outgoing antiparticle. The moment, energy and momentum of the outgoing antiparticle is the same as the energy and momentum of the incoming particle, because multiplying this thing by minus 1 just changes which branch of this convention you read, but not the final result. <laughs> OK, and vice versa, incoming antiparticles go into outgoing particles, etc. That's the TCP theorem. I adopt that convention. I just said, if I have considered this four-particle graph, I will adopt a new notational convention where I orient all momentum inward and tell whether a line is absorbing a particle or emitting an antiparticle by looking at the sign of the fourth component of P. That's certainly my privilege to adopt such a notational convention. Given a set of four Ps, I know uniquely which ones are associated with incoming objects and which ones are associated with outgoing objects. It's just a change of notational convention. Okay? Instead of saying, instead of saying I've got these four lines sticking out and I'll arrange them some to the right and some to the left, okay, and orient the momentum along the lines if they're on the li right and the other way along the line, going inward if they're on the right and outward if they're going on the left. I say I won't bother about right and left. I'll orient all my momentum inward and tell whether there should be in the other convention distributed on the right or the left by the sign of P0. Certainly my privilege. And it's just that in that symmetric way of doing things, which is not the best way if I'm explicitly computing pi on nucleon scattering or something, but is the best way if I want to consider this whole set of processes simultaneously, this is manifest. If I'd done it the other way, it would be less manifest. If, by convention. Yeah, by convention. I'll, I just orient all, I orient all my four momenta along the line. O always going into the guts of the graph. Just, just a notational convention. That's useful for this problem, not for other problems. Other questions? Hmm? Um, when we do the phase mismatch up, Argument for matching normalization. Mm -hmm. Do you want the counter term to cancel all the phase or leave some of the phase due to the physical mass of the particle? Okay. No, I want it to cancel all the phase ultimately in the large T limit. Don't worry too much about that because very soon, next lecture in fact, we will begin the abolition of the turning on and off function. That mass counter term will occur again, but for a completely different argument. You will end up with the same answer, but for a different reason. Okay, of course, that's not surprising. It's the nature of a true prescription for computing scattering amplitudes that there are many alternative ways by which it can be derived. <laughs> now, if there are no further questions, this lecture, or what remains of it, I will devote to the ex systematic exploitation of these formulas. And in particular, this will be nice because it will be dull and not involve any new ideas. <laughs>
and therefore you don't have to worry too hard. If you fall asleep, you can wake up and you'll just glance at the board and you'll see all the algebra that led to the <laughs> final result. <laughs> and I will, uh, I will apply this to five bell topics. I will discuss decay processes. Oh, every once in a while, I'll probably be tempted to make a side remark that will be confusing, but it will be mainly pedestrian. <laughs> decay processes, cross-sections, I'll explicitly evaluate D for two particle final states. in the center of mass frame. I'll discuss the famous optical theorem that connects, as you know, from non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude to the total cross-section. And I will um, discuss uh, D for three particle final states and say a little bit more about those Dallas plots that are so useful that I mentioned briefly when I was discussing the Mandel stamp variable. Again in the center of mass frame. Let us begin with a, um, I would like to discuss decay processes firstly. That is to say we set out a, um, we start out with some one particle state that would be stable were it not for the interactions, turn on the interactions and watch it decay. We know the rate at which it decays from our general master magic formula over there. There's only one particle in the initial state. So the differential transition probability, the amplitude for decaying into some n particle final state, is called in this case d gamma by convention. <coughs> That's the name it is given. It's a differential, something dqp1, dqp2, dqp3, if you've got a three-particle final state. And it is given by our master formula, 1 over 2e for the initial particle. I don't bother to put an index on it because there's only one energy. I'll write e sub p if it's a particle of momentum p. Afi squared times the invariant phase space differential d. The total transition probability per unit time is called capital gamma and is obtained by integrating d gamma over all final particle states, which I write as integral. And if there are many final particle states into which this thing can decay, three mesons, two mesons, a nucleon, and an antinucleon, etc. I sum over all possible ones. I'll write that symbol, sum an integral over final, meaning I integrate over all the momenta in the final states, and then sum over all the different possible kinds of final states. <coughs> the, um, it is typically evaluated by convention for the particle at rest. The moment, incoming momentum of the momentum of the incoming particle is zero. When you see a table of gammas, they don't say this is gamma for the particle moving at one third the speed of light. And this, they usually use at rest by convention, and that is of course one over two m, because that is the mass, whatever the mass of the incoming particle is, m or mu, if we're studying a meson or a nucleon or some other kind of particle. Integral, sum, and integral over the final states. This way of writing the formula makes it um, very clear what the decay amplitude is for a moving particle. 
because uh, this is a Lorentz invariant measure. This is a Lorentz invariant object. So this number, when we're done summing and integrating, is Lorentz invariant. Therefore, if we evaluate for the incoming momentum equal to something else, p, then the only difference is this part doesn't change. It's just this thing in front that changes. So we get m. of m squared plus p squared to turn 1 over 2m into 1 over 2e sub p times gamma. This, of course, just what we would expect from Lorentz invariance. This equation expresses the fact that a moving pi meson decays more slowly than a stationary pi meson, and it's precisely the Lorentz factor we expect to get there. <laughs> the faster it moves, the more slowly it decays. <clears throat> that helps to explain the physical meaning, at least in this case, of those mysterious factors of 1 over 2e for the initial particle, the only thing that is not Lorentz invariant in our expression, it's damn well had better be there. Otherwise, we would have predicted that a moving particle decayed at the same rate as a stationary particle, which would be bad news both from the viewpoint of relativity theory and from the viewpoint of experiment. <laughs> Any questions on this pedestrian point? I will now turn to a two-particle initial state and discuss, this is the first pedestrian point that is completed. I will now turn to the second pedestrian point, which is for a two-particle, um, sorry, for a two-particle initial state where we define differential cross-sections. The differential cross-section, if we have a beam of particles impinging on a stationary target, or if we have a moving target moving into a beam of particles, is defined as a differential transition probability per unit time, per unit flux. That is simply the convention we adopt. We do so. D sigma, the differential element of cross-section, is by definition differential transition probability per unit time, per unit flux. That is to say, we divide by the flux of particles impinging on the target, as you all know from non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Since our normalization convention is such that we can think of one of the particles of having probability 1 for being somewhere in the box, and the other particle having probability 1 for being in a given unit volume, the flux, the, the amount of beam particle hitting the target particle per unit time, is the velocity difference. So this is 1 over v1, the ordinary three-dimensional velocity of the first particle, v2, times 1 over 4e1, e2, from our general formula on the right-hand board, times the FI squared D. The uh, total cross-section is obtained, of course, by summing and integrating over the final states. This is a total cross section. I'm sorry, I seem to be attempting to steal your bag with my. This little shoplifter's device. <laughs> the, uh, the, yes, sir? D, the density factor, or the density in, in position space of the initial 
Well, I can think of one of these particles as being the target. Of course, which of these two p's I associate the square root of v with is a matter of taste. But let me consider the first one as being the target. It is somewhere in the box. The second one is the beam. It has got probability 1 for being someplace in the box. So then I have the target moving through the box with velocity v1, the beam moving through the box with velocity v2, the amount of the probability flux hitting the target for is 1 is uh, v1 minus v2. The ordinary non-relativistic difference of velocities. I emphasize that. A friend of mine um, who once did a thesis on neutrino-neutrino scattering, a rather abstract subject but of some cosmological interest, had a factor of 4 error in his thesis because he said, oh, they're relativistic particles. The relative velocity here must be c. It is not. For neutrino-neutrino scattering, it is 2c. <laughs> if they're heading on to each other. <laughs> we'll see that that's consistent with relativity also. Uh, because that's actually the flux. There's this beam moving. There's this thing impinging on the beam. If I turn on my stopwatch for one second and ask, ask by how much, how much beam has passed the target in that one second, the answer is 1 over v1, v1 minus v2 worth of beam. That's unambiguous, OK? It's not relativity. Non-relativity <laughs> is the definition of velocity. <laughs> Yes? Um, this is general, not assuming they're parallel. I'm not assuming they're parallel. We will discuss that shortly. Of course, this is, by the way, the total cross section is, since this into everything else is Lorentz invariant, we have an apparently non Lorentz invariant factor in front 1 over 4 e1, e2. v1 minus v2 times a Lorentz invariant. I will now discuss the Lorentz transformation properties of the factor in front to demonstrate that they are what would, one would normally think they should be. Can I erase these? Oh, well, I'll write this equation down again. I'll have to use it again. to demonstrate that they are what one would think they should be in the cases where uh, things are as they should be. Let me consider the special form of this expression in a, in a Lorentz frame in which the two particles are moving head on to each other, or one is tr catching up to the other, where the two three momenta are aligned. Therefore, I will consider P1 equals E1 P1x, the x component, 0, 0, p2 equals e2, p2x, 0, 0. The um, v1 or v2 is, of course, a particular case, well, get to that later. v1 for e1 e2, v1 minus v2 equals 4 e1 e2, p1 absolute value, p1x over e1 minus p2x over e2 equals 4 absolute value, p1x e2 minus p2x e1. For later computations, <coughs> it will be um, useful to uh, have the expression for this in the center of mass frame, where p1 in the center of mass frame, this simply becomes 4 times the total energy times script p, where p1x P2x equals minus P. That's the center of mass frame. And P is some positive number. <laughs>
So this is a simple expression in the center of mass frame, and E total is the total energy of the two particles, E1 plus E2. Now, we all know from non-relativistic physics the geometrical picture of the total cross-section and why it is called a cross-section. We have a flux of particles, say, heading this way. We have some object, there it is, or for which it is scattering, perhaps heading this way. We say that the total cross-section gives the total probability of scattering because it is, it is simply the geometrical cross-section presented by the object. If the beam hits the object, it scatters in classical picture. If it misses the object, it doesn't. Um, this picture would indicate that the total cross-section should be the same in any Lorentz frame that preserves this condition. Because if I make a Lorentz transformation along this direction, which preserves this condition, then I will, um, that is to say, a Lorentz transformation restricted to the 0, 1 plane. Then, of course, I will change the appearance of this object in this direction by a dilation, but I won't change its perpendicular dimensions, and I won't change its cross-section. Of course, if I make another kind of Lorentz transformation, then things are different. Then I am distorting the particle in the direction that the beam sees, and then I shouldn't expect the total cross-section to be invariant. <clears throat> now, let's check that this is so. Is this or is this not invariant under Lorentz transformations restricted to the 0, 1 plane? Well, it's very obvious that it is once I've got things in this form because P1x E2 minus P2x E1 absolute value is simply absolute value, epsilon 2, 3, mu nu, p1 nu, p2 nu. Where 2, 3 here are the Lorentz indices. Uh, 2, 3 are yz. <laughs> right? Because this is completely anti-symmetric object. We talked about it before. Therefore, it only has two non-vanishing terms if we fix these to be 2 and 3. One where this is 0 and this is 1. One where this is 1 and this is 0. They have a minus sign between them, and they give you this term and this term. Or maybe they give you this term and this term. It doesn't matter. I've got an absolute value in front. <laughs> now, this expression is obviously invariant under restricted Lorentz transformations that only act on the 0, 1 frame, 0, 1 variables, because 2 and 3 don't change. <laughs> and the rest is a Lorentz invariant sum. So this is OK. The total cross-section does what it should. If in any Lorentz frame where the uh, momenta are of this kind, you compute the total cross-section, you get the same result as in any other Lorentz frame where the momentum is of this uh, form. OK, second pedestrian point, settled. Cross-sections, Lorentz contract like they should Lorentz contract, i.e., not at all if you make your Lorentz transformation along the direction of the beam. <coughs> Please notice once again the mysterious factors of 1 over e that come into our formula for the transition probability per unit time are essential for this right result to come out. We now turn to the third pedestrian topic. I've completed my general statements, but if I want to do specific computations, it would be very nice to have a more compact expression for the density of final states than this awful expression for d. So let me now compute d for a two-particle final state. <coughs> 
initial particles are in the center of mass frame. That's the simplest case. It's also pretty easy to do it in some other frame, but I'll do it in this frame because life is very simple then. We have our general formula for D in this case. We have two particles, so we have dqp1, dqp2. Each of the two particles brings a 2 pi to the sixth, along with a 2 pi cubed along with it. And we have four E1, E2. Please do not confuse this E1 and E2 with the E1 and E2 above. Those were the E1 and E2 of the initial particles. These are the E1 and E2 of the two final particles. <clears throat> this is all about the final state. Then there is 2 pi to the fourth times our four-dimensional energy momentum conserving delta function, which I'll split into delta cubed of P1 plus P2 minus zero times delta of E1 plus E2 minus the total energy, which is, of course, the total incoming energy. We now want to cancel out some of the delta functions against some of the differentials. The easy one to do first is to cancel out the P2. This, use this delta function to determine P2 and use that to cancel out the dq P2. Thus, just as in our derivation, you, you, we all know this trick of canceling delta functions against differentials. I talked about it when we were getting the invariant element of, uh, of uh, volume. So if we, that is to say, if we integrate this with any function, we might as well. The, doing the integral is the same as replacing P1 by minus P2 and canceling the dq P2 and canceling the delta function. So this is dq P1. I'll now gather together my two pi's. I might as well do it at this stage, two pi squared. 4 E1 E2 delta of E1 plus E2 minus E total. So where P2 is now restrained to be restricted to be minus P1. And of course that means E2 is also is a function of P1 also. I now go to angular variables and write this as P squared the magnitude of P1, dP, d omega, 2 pi squared, 4 E1, E2, delta of E1 plus E2 minus the total incoming energy. Now I'm going to use the uh, delta, cancel the delta function of the incoming energy against the dP. It fixes the magnitude of P. An important rule that I presume you all know is that integral dx f, uh, delta of f of x equals um, 1 over absolute value of f prime of x naught, the derivative of x with respect to of that, where f of x naught is the zero. And if there are several zeros, you get a sum of such term from each zero. But there won't be in this case. <coughs> um, therefore, when I cancel the delta function against the dp, I get p squared d omega. 2 pi squared, 4 E1, E2, 1 over, I don't need the absolute value since these are positive quantities, the E1 dp plus de2 dp. E1 and E2 are both functions of p, since by eliminating the previous delta function, we have constrained the magnitude of the second momentum to be the same as the magnitude of the first. Yes, sir? Here to here? Right. Well, it's a usual game. If I'm writing an element of volume, let's say, say I've got something like dx dy, delta of x minus y, uh, sorry, delta of y minus y naught. OK? And I integrate this with any function f of x minus y, f of x comma y, 
OK. And then this is the equals f of integral f of x y naught dx. OK, therefore, in an expression of this kind, which I'm always going to be integrating with some function, typically with a step function, they're equal under an integral. That is to say, a de this thing with a delta function is equal to uh, the thing with the delta function canceled and a subsidiary condition, p2 equals minus p1. OK. OK. That's the sense in which they're equal. OK, as elements of volume for which you integrate arbitrary functions, integrating an arbitrary function with this element of volume is equivalent to integrating an arbitrary function with this element of volume and making the substitution. OK. Now, we have, of course, we know how to compute the EDP. The EDP is P over E. So this is going through every step in the slowest, most pedestrian way. 2 pi squared for e1, e2, 1 over p over e1 plus p over e2, which is equal to so the p's cancel. I multiply out by the e1, e2, and get e1 plus e2, which is e total. So I simply get p squared p d omega over 16 pi squared e total. Okay. Now, this is an important enough formula to make me put it in a box. D in the center of mass frame is P, and I'll put a little subscript F so you'll remember it's the momentum of the final particle I'm talking about, not the momentum of the initial particles in the center of mass frame. They're different if the final and initial particles have different masses. D omega of the final particle over 16 pi squared E total. In the particular case of computing d sigma d omega, we of course have that other factor which comes in, which in the center of mass frame also has a, um, in fact I've erased it, and since I've forgotten it I should look it up, I should finally get out my notes and look it up. I got to here, I got to here, got to here, I'm here which, as you recall, in the center of mass frame was the initial momenta times 4 times the total energy, which we've got to divide out by. So I get Pf over Pi, um, 1 over E total squared, d omega, uh, no, I've divided the d omega onto the other side, 1 over 4 times 16, I believe is 64, 64 pi squared. all in the center of mass frame. Please notice P initial was the initial momentum. I just called it P when I was only talking about the initial states, but now I want to distinguish it between the final momentum. Oh, oh. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, that would be an amazing result. It would save us a lot of, save us a lot of Feynman computations. <laughs> Now, this is a good point. We can use this formula to uh, make the correspondence between our non-relativistic and relativistic notational conventions, which is a useful thing to do if we ever want to check that things have the right non-relativistic limit. Because, as you recall, for in non-relativistic, hmm, sorry, I should have made two remarks. One is, please notice the factor of Pf over Pi. 
This means that if we have a inelastic scattering process in which the masses of the final particles are different than those of the initial particles, so PF equals PI, even though time reversal may tell us that the amplitude for the process is the same as the amplitude for the time reverse process, this does not mean the cross section for the process is the same as the cross section for the time reverse process because we have PF over PI in one case and PI over PF in another. So the amplitude, this of course is also a familiar result from non-relativistic physics if you've ever studied things like the scattering of electrons off atoms where they can excite the atom, exothermic and endothermic reactions. This means that if I have two time reverse processes, it is not true even in a theory with time reversal invariance that the cross sections are necessarily the same. The amplitudes are necessarily the same, but we have this factor entering in a different way in the two processes, so the cross sections will in general be different. Thus, for example, in our model, the total cross-section for nucleon-antinucleon annihilation into meson plus meson is not the same as the total cross-section for meson-meson production of a nucleon-antinucleon pair, even though the amplitudes are identical. Second remark, we can now compare to non-relativistic physics. In non-relativistic physics, we also define a scattering amplitude. And there is defined in a very simple, so that the corresponding formula is very simple. No, I shouldn't say non-relativistic physics. In the kind of quantum mechanics we study to use, uh, in the kind of normalization conventions we study that are convenient for non-relativistic physics, or we, although if we had been perverse, we could have used exactly the same normalization conventions in studying relativistic physics. The scattering amplitude, which is usually called F of K and cosine theta, is defined in such a way such that you have a much simpler formula, which you all remember, P I should call it. You all, I presume, remember that formula. That's a hard formula to forget. <laughs> Comparing these two equations, of course, this is usually done only in the case PF equals P initial. We normally talk about this only in scattering in a potential where PF equals P initial. So in this case, we see the connection between the relativistic and the non-relativistic scattering amplitude. F equals A over 8 pi E total. Well, we haven't really established that. We've established that to within a plus or minus sign, but the next, in a few minutes when I get the optical theorem, we'll check that the sign is also right. This is the scattering amplitude as conventionally defined in non-relativistic potential scattering, how it is related to our relativistic scattering amplitude. Uh, how do you know there might not be a I'll check that from the optical theorem. I mean, obviously, it's only either going to be an overall plus or minus sign or an I or something, because the only difference between the relativistic and the non-relativistic definitions is the normalization of the states. <laughs> Which doesn't have any funny phases in it. The states rotate in non-relativistic physics the same way they rotate in relativistic physics. Now, we'll now check the sign and also get a useful result from a, um, by doing the optical theorem. For simplicity, I will assume I am working in a theory in which there are only, is only one kind of particle. So when I sum over all, for one a meson, say, so that when I sum over all final states, I don't have to unnecessarily complicate my notation to indicate summing over mesons and summing over nucleons and summing over antinucleons. The generalization of my arguments to more complicated theories will be trivial. I start out with this famous equation. I'd better be careful I get all my signs right, so let me drag this thing over in front of me. S adjoint S equals 1. I will deduce a consequence of this equation. 
Our invariant amplitudes are defined in terms of s minus 1. But it's pretty easy to divide, find a corresponding equation for this. I get 1 from the SS adjoint minus S minus S adjoint plus 1, which is minus S minus 1 minus S, uh, S minus 1 adjoint. I now evaluate this between two particle initial and final states which I will choose to be now relativistically normalized. I equals P1 comma P2. F equals P1 prime, P2 prime. And I assume I'm in the center of mass frame. P1 plus P2 equals 0. <clears throat> the easiest thing to evaluate, I'll begin with the uh, left hand side, remember that F S minus 1 I plus I AIF whole thing like times 2 pi to the fourth delta PF minus pi. That's the right-hand side of this equation evaluated between f and i. Now, the left-hand side of this equation evaluated between f and i, I will write in terms of a complete set of intermediate states. <coughs> I'm assuming there's only one kind of particle, so a complete set of intermediate states consists of the n-particle states. sum on n, integral d4 P q1, d4 qn. These are relative, sorry, wrong, t cubed q1. These are one particle states, but there's, they're many particle states, but the individual particles are still on the mass shell. The relativistic dense normalization factor, 2 pi cubed 2 e1, dot, dot, dot. 2 pi cubed 2 en. <clears throat> and then I have final s minus 1 times an expression which to avoid writing down in detail I'll just call m. m equals q1 Qn, m, s minus 1 adjoint initial. And of course, I should divide by 1 over n factorial to keep from overcounting the states. Oops, not outside the square sum over n, surely. <laughs> Better put that inside. Is everybody happy? That's simply the exp expression written in terms of a sum of a complete set of intermediate states. Now, let me put this term in brackets so I don't have to write this god-awful integral over and over again. <laughs> and the thing in brackets equals, well, it, once again, we have I, A, mf uh, minus i, uh, sorry, afm, excuse me, final state is f, minus i ami, 2 pi to the fourth, delta 4 of p initial minus pm, 2 pi to the fourth, delta 4, of p initial minus uh, p final minus pm by the definition of the invariant amplitude. Uh, yes, complex conjugated, thank you. And it should be AIM star then. <laughs> 
That's right, because the adjoint I complex conjugate and exchange the thing. <coughs> now, I could just as well replace this last factor, since it is multiplied by a delta function of pi minus pm, by delta 4 of pf minus pi. Once I do that, I have 2 pi to the fourth delta fourth of pf minus pi on both sides of the equation, where I can divide it out. Thus, I can divide out And once I have divided out, I can set i equal to f, because I then don't encounter an infinity. <laughs> Let's do that. What do I get on the right hand side on the left hand side of this equation? This has been divided out. This is simply minus, not minus, plus twice the imaginary part of AII. Once I set i equal to f, that's what this combination is. What do I get on the right-hand side? Well, I get something very interesting. No, so there is. Exchange initial and final and complex conjugate. <laughs> Twice the imaginary part of AII. What do I have here? Well, if i is equal to the f, this is the square of the invariant amplitude times this thing, times this thing integrated over all final states. And this is just our invariant d factor. Well, let me write it down. Sum and integral over all, m, all the states labeled by m of a m i, absolute value squared, times d. That is to say, it is the total cross-section, except for that funny factor we have to divide by. So it is 4p e total. That was the funny factor we had to divide by times the total cross-section. Thus, after excruciatingly dull labors, we have arrived, as a consequence of the unitarity of the S matrix, of the famous optical theorem, which asserts that the imaginary part of the relativistic forward scattering amplitude equals twice the momentum of the particles in the center of mass frame, incoming or outgoing, it doesn't matter because they're the same. It's the for scattering, elastic scattering amplitude in the forward direction, initial state sum is the same as the final state. The total momentum in the center of mass frame times the total cross section. It is just a consequence of the unitarity of the S matrix, and therefore is a very general result. Just to check, <coughs> let's compare this with the famous optical theorem of uh, non-relativistic scattering theory. You recall that F of P cosine theta equals 0 was 1 over 8 pi e total AII. So therefore, imaginary part of f of p in the forward direction, cosine theta equals 0. That's nonsense. Cosine theta equals 1 is the forward direction. <laughs> cosine theta equals 1 <laughs> is equal to, by some elementary algebra, p over 4 pi times sigma, which you should recognize as the optical theorem of non-relativistic scattering theory. Indeed, we didn't have to go through this relativistic thing because the optical theorem of non-relativistic scattering theory is true whether or not the theory is relativistically invariant. We've really gone through it's just the consequence of unitarity and rotational invariance, both of which are true in a, in a relativistic theory as well as in a non-relativistic theory. 
Uh, but it's an amusing exercise in case you didn't see it in non-relativistic quantum mechanics to see it here. What? Writing this only as a function of cosine theta. In fact, rotational invariance is not relevant. I should have said it's just a function, translational invariance, so you can use momentum eigenstates. Mm -hmm. It's forward. It really doesn't matter. Yes, that's true. It's just a consequence of unitarity, period. <laughs> By the way, this, this shows that we have got the right sign when we had made the identification of A with the, with the uh, forwards, with the scattering amplitude. OK, onwards into further dullness. I will now consider, ooh, -hoo, I may have left, lost that piece of paper, in which case I will be able to go through, oh, no, there it is. I will now consider phase space for three-body final states, the last of my dull topics. Just to show you that these integrals are not particularly difficult. I will do three body final states. In the center of mass frame. Since you've already seen me do, do one of these calculations in gory detail, I will skip to immediately to something you can see by eyeball. I'll write down D. Firstly, we'll take care of the two pi's. There are three, there are three two pi's for each of the final particles. And there is a two pi to the fourth from the delta function. So that's one over two pi to the fifth. There's a energy denominator, two E for each final particle. So that gives us one over eight, E1, E2, E3. There's a d cubed p1, which I will immediately write in angular form. p1 squared dp1 d omega 1. There's a d cubed p2, which I will also immediately write in angular form. Omega 2. There's a d cubed p3, which I will use to cancel off against the space part of the delta function and therefore not write it down. And there is the remaining delta of E1 plus E2 plus E3 minus E total. The hard part will be doing the integral to get rid of the E3, which will, you will cancel out one of our uh, variables. To pick which variable to cancel out, I'll use a favorite. Is there any question about the origin of this formula? I've just shortcut several of the steps that are identical in the previous case. Yes, sir? No, I took the whole d cubed p3 and used it to cancel out the three-dimensional delta function. Okay. Instead of d omega 1, d omega 2, I'll write that as d omega 1, d omega 1, 2. That is to say, instead of, I would integrate over the relative angle between the first and the second particle. Instead of integrating over the first and the second. That is, I'll hold the first fixed and integrate over the second, and then integrate over the first, which can be written as d omega 1, d phi 1, 2, d cosine theta 1, 2, where theta 1, 2 is the relative angle between 1 and 2. <coughs> Let's make a little drawing. Here's P1 off here someplace. Here's P2 off here someplace. And between them is the angle theta 1, 2. Now, uh, the only th I will use the energy conserving delta function to cancel off theta 1, 2 because E3 is the only thing that depends on that angle when we keep all the other variables fixed. And E3 equals square root of P1 squared plus P2 squared. I'll put in the big square root in a moment. 
plus 2, magnitude of P1, magnitude of P2, cosine theta 1, 2, plus the mass of the third particle squared. OK? Thus, the thing we need, which is dE3 d cosine theta 1, 2, is rather simple. We have 1 over the square root, which is 1 over e3. The 2 here cancels the 2 in the square root. And I simply get p1, p2 over e3. Thus, I can use the cosine, the delta function, to cancel off the d cosine theta 1, 2. And I shall, leaving me with d equals 1 over 2 pi to the fifth, 1 over 8, e1, e2, e3. <coughs> p1 squared dp1, p2 squared dp2, d omega 1, d phi 1, 2. And now I'm dividing by this factor. So I have an e3 in the numerator and a p1, p2 in the denominator, which leads to some evident cancellations. Oh, that's p2 squared. I'm sorry, I didn't write down the subscript 2. Now, this expression becomes especially simple once you realize that PDP is EDE, the famous result. So P1 DP1 is just DE1, uh, E1 DE1. So even more of the denominators cancel out when I make that substitution. And I find a remarkably simple expression for the density factor in three body The phase space, it is 1 over 8 times 2 pi to the fifth dE1, dE2, d omega 1, d phi 1, 2, which is not so horrible after all. Can you just say that uh, PDP is DDE, that 2 also Yeah, E squared is P squared plus M squared. Okay, PDP is EDE. <laughs> now, so even in relativistic physics, the density of states is pretty simple. The, uh, however, the trouble, this, this doesn't mean that calculating total cross sections for three body decays is something I'm going to give you as a homework problem, because <clears throat> The allowed ranges of phi 1, 2, and omega 1 can obviously be whatever you want. But E1 and E2 are severely restricted because this step is true only if, as cosine theta 1, 2 goes from, zero to, from minus 1 to 1, the, uh, delta, the 0 in the delta function occurs within the range of integration. E1 and E2 are not allowed to range freely. Indeed, we can see what happens. At one extreme, where the two vectors are aligned, the sum of the energy is square root of p1 squared plus m1 squared plus square root of p1 squared p2 squared plus m2 squared plus square root of p1 plus p2. That's the biggest p3 can get squared plus m3 squared. And that upper range in the integration has better be greater than or equal to e total, which in turn must be greater or lower than the lower range, greater than or equal to the lower range of the integration, which is ditto plus ditto plus 
with a minus sign in here. This defines a god-awful, hideous-looking region in P1, P2 space, or equivalently E1, E2 space. One can work on it and beat on it and find out finally that you end only end up with a cubic equation involving E1 and E2 to determine the boundaries of this region. But that is still a pretty god-awful thing. So there is some terrible-looking region in E1, E2 space, or in the E1, E2, E3 dollars plot, something that looks it's not quite as monstrous as that. I believe it's convex. <laughs> but <laughs> in general, there is a monstrous blob where the kinematics allow, allow the final particles to come out. And although you do have a simple thing to integrate it, you integrate, you have to integrate it over terrible boundaries of integration, which causes strong men to weep and women to quail and sensible people to go to their nearest digital computer. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> An especially interesting application of this formula is in the decay of a spinless particle. If a spinless particle decays, or indeed into three spinless particles, or indeed if a, um, if a particle with spin decays into particles with spin, but you average over all the spins, so there's no preferred direction, then obviously the uh, d differential decay amplitude, d gamma, doesn't depend on the angular variables phi 1, 2, and omega 1. Of course, that's not true if you have a particle with a definite spin, because then there's a definite direction, or if you have two particles coming in, because then there's a definite direction, the direction in which they come in. Therefore, for decay of a spinless particle, the only thing you have to look at You might as well automatically do the sum over omega 1 and phi 1, 2 of d. And then you get, aside from numerical factors, which out of sheer perversity I will compute, they're 8 pi squared, 2 pi times 4 pi. Eight times two pi to the fifth, de one, de two. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. You're quite right. I should have written integral over omega one two and over phi over omega one and over phi one two of d. <clears throat> which is now about 2 to the 5th is 32, 1 over 32, 2 to the 5th is 32, yes, pi cubed, de1, de2. Thus, in such a case, if you're doing an experiment on the decay of a particle, you will frequently find people making plots whenever they, in E1, E2, or in a symmetric E1, E2, E3 diagram, analogous to the Mandelstam diagram. They will put little dots whenever they've observed a decay event. And this is very groovy because you can directly read off the square of the invariant matrix element without going through any kinematic computations. You just eyeball it off. It is proportional to the density of dots. <laughs> And that's very, with a factor of proportionality, which we know, 1 over 32 pi cubed. And that's very nice when you're trying to see if experiment and theory fit to not have to do any complicated phase-based computations. Any questions? There are no questions because everything is totally understandable, as you know. As you have caught on, this course is divided into two kinds of lectures, those that are totally understandable and inexpressibly boring, and those that have exciting ideas in them. Well, perhaps I'm giving myself errors, but are absolutely incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> next week, next week we will turn to the second kind of lecture. <laughs> this, uh, this completes 
uh, completes if you do those homework problems. I am, did not give any specific examples of computing a d sigma d omega or a decay rate because I gave you homework problems. You're supposed to do them. Do them. The, uh, this completes our first path through at a primitive form of scattering theory. Um, we are now going to try and redeem our scattering theory in all of our Feynman graphs by refounding things in such a way that the uh, turning on and off function f of t does not appear and doing things straight in the real world. This will involve a long sequence of arguments. It will take up, uh, just the beginning of it will take up a week and working out all the details that follow from it which will involve us in all sorts of strange things with strange names like wave function renormalization, will take another week. So it's going to take us a lot of time. And it's going to begin in a rather abstract way by um, investigating in our old framework of scattering theory what seems to be a silly question. I'll tell you what the silly question is now, although the investigation won't proceed until the next lecture. The silly question is, what is the meaning of a Feynman diagram when the external lines are off the mass shell? We, have a, we say that a Feynman diagram gives us a scattering amplitude when the external lines are on the mass shell. However, if I take a Feynman diagram, let's take a particularly complicated and grotesque looking one for meson-meson scattering. If I take a Feynman diagram, the Feynman rules, as I wrote them, don't say the external lines have to be on the mass shell. If I were some sort of maniac, I could compute this diagram with the external lines, not obeying the equations p squared equals m squared, if I just like doing hard computations. Does this object have any meaning? A Feynman diagram with the lines off the mass shell. Well. <clears throat> It has a sort of uh, primitive, uh, silly meaning or trivial meaning that one can, um, one can uh, see. It uh, could be the internal part of some more complicated Feynman diagram. <laughs> Let's make it a, um, a sca meson meson scattering diagram. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's a homework problem. Okay. If I'm going to evaluate this diagram, haha, if I have a hope of evaluating this diagram, one way of I might try and do it is to put a dotted line around this thing, evaluate it, get some function of the four moment the four four momenta coming in at the four vertices, plug that dotted thing as a black box into the bigger diagram, and then do the big integrals. So at least in that sense, there is some sense of talking about a Feynman diagram with the lines off the mass shell. It might be the internal part of a more complicated Feynman diagram, although these lines have to be on the mass shell in my Feynman rules. These lines don't because they're internal lines. Now, next lecture, I will um, show that within the framework of our old scattering theory, these Feynman diagrams with lines off the mass shell have, can be given two meanings aside from the rather trivial meaning I have assigned to them by drawing this dotted circle. One is one can show that these Feynman graphs, or rather the sum of all Feynman graphs with a given number of external lines, can be related to objects called Green's functions that determine the response of the system to a particular kind of external source. In particular, if I take the, the Hamiltonian density for the system, and combine together, say, model 1 and model 3, there's a lot of interactions in H, but there's also a lot of an external source, and were to compute the vacuum to vacuum matrix elements in the presence of rho. Now I can make particles with my source, but it won't be as simple because the particles are interacting. If I were to compute the vacuum-to-vacuum ma vacuum matrix elements in the presence of rho, I obviously have a new interaction in the theory caused by rho that I'll write down the analytic form of next lecture. 
And that new interaction enters, makes new Feynman diagrams. And if I am to compute what happens in this thing, say to fourth order in rho and some order in the coupling constant, one of the diagrams I will encounter will be this old Feynman diagram, the thing with the circle around it here. And now the former external lines are internal lines and therefore have to be integrated around off the mesh shell. So I will, while we work out the details of that next lecture, develop a second meaning of these objects as Green's functions in the primitive sense of George Green, something that tells you the response of something when you kick it. <laughs> a function that gives the response of the system to an external source. And then I will give a third meaning. I will show that, in fact, these things express a certain property, which I will specify next lecture, of the, solu of the Heisenberg fields, the exact solutions to the Heisenberg equations of motion. I will then assemble these three things and write down a formula that makes no apparent before a scattering amplitude. That is really just a statement that you get a scattering amplitude by taking a Feynman graph with the lines off the mass shell and putting the lines on the mass shell. <laughs> and connects that to a certain expression constructed of the, of the Heisenberg fields. That expression will turn out <coughs> to have no reference in it to speak of to our original adiabatic turning on and off function. And that will be the starting point of our new investigation of scattering theory because I will then attempt by going through considerable contortions and waving my hands at a ferocious rate <laughs> to justify that expression without talking about the turning on and off function and thus getting a formulation of scattering theory that has nothing to do with turning on and off. That is the outline of next week.